Good morning, everyone. Good to have each of you out this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you all for coming and being with us this morning. This morning, we're going to kind of conclude. We've been on a little series <coughs> for the last few weeks concerning sin. Three weeks ago, we spoke about why we tolerate sin. Why do we hang on to it for as long as we do? Last week, we talked about the impact of that sin in our lives. And then today, we're going to ask the question. In the title of our message today, the question is, what is the answer to our sin? Now, as we come today, we come to celebrate the ordinance of communion. This ordinance was given to us by Christ. And as we come today to celebrate what Christ has given us, there's a reason behind it. It is because of the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ that we have the opportunity for our sin to be reconciled and that we can be drawn to the Lord. So why is there a need for the ordinance? That answers that question. What would compel a holy God to send his son into a sinful world and die on our behalf? Have you thought about that? Have you given that consideration for your own life? What is it that would compel God? It's the love, obviously, but what's the purpose of it? I want to tell you what the purpose of it is today. It is that God desires to restore us to a right relationship to himself, and that can only come by the reconciliation of our sins. Christ died that we might be restored, and he became our atonement. And God's desire has always been relationship between us and himself. And folks, it is because of sin today that that relationship has been broken. Throughout history, we find sin to be the barrier to that right relationship, and God's grace toward us to be the opportunity for that restoration. And we're going to be looking in the scripture this morning at a time in Judah and Israel's history where sin was rampant. And that happened often. And today when we look around our society, the world that we live in today, we see that sin again is rampant. And God is still pursuing us. How many of you are glad today that God pursues us even when we are in sin, to bring us back into that right relationship. I'm thankful for it today. I'm thankful that Jesus Christ came. Romans 5, 8, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm so thankful that God did not ask me to clean myself up, to make myself worthy of his sacrifice or worthy of his love, but that he gives me that opportunity through Jesus Christ. But one of our problems is... That on the other hand, we have tried every shortcut imaginable to attempt to find God's favor that is short of his plan. We put everything else out there. We put our goodness out there. We put our abilities out there. We say, well, look at what a great person I am. Well, if I only did this or if I only did that, and folks, those are shortcuts that never bring us back to that right relationship with God. They are futile efforts on our behalf to attempt to come back into that plan of the Lord. And even now, we're still continuing to use those weak and beggarly elements to get around the pure, wholehearted obedience to God and His Word. In the Old Testament, one of the most prominent voices that God used to call His people to repentance and right relationship with Him was the prophet Isaiah. And no doubt many of you have read and have seen the, the words that God gave to Isaiah. God used Isaiah to declare his love. God used Isaiah to show his displeasure in and to reveal his judgment upon his people. So God loves us. He is displeased with us in our sin, and God will judge us if we don't find our way out of that through Jesus Christ. Isaiah declared the future coming of Christ. One of the most prominent, 
messianic prophecies uh, or prophets of the Old Testament is found as Isaiah was given the word of the Lord and given the foreknowledge to be able to see ahead and to see the coming of Jesus Christ who would be sufficient for the atonement of our sins. My abilities are insufficient. Your abilities are insufficient. But it was because of Jesus Christ today that we can have sufficiency for our sins. Isaiah's prophetic ministry lasted for more than 60 years. It took place during the time of the divided kingdom. In the Old Testament, there came a time uh, after Solomon had died that uh, the kingdom became divided under the leadership of one of his sons. <clears throat> Israel took the northern half of the kingdom, or the northernmost part, and Judah remained in the southernmost part and having the control of, of Jerusalem there. And the entirety of the land, although much of Isaiah's prophecy was to Judah, to the southern kingdom, it applied because sin was rampant. There was careless disobedience to God throughout the entire nation of Israel. They lived out a fake surface obedience to God that did not reach fully into their hearts. Folks, I want us to know today that God desires a full relationship, a heart relationship with us. There are a lot of people today. There, are, there were a lot of people in the scriptures. There are a lot of people today who have a head knowledge of God. Yes, I acknowledge that he's out there. And folks, that's a beginning. But it takes more than just having a head knowledge of God, just a, a, an acknowledgement of his existence. In the New Testament, it's talked about how that, that even the, the demons know that there is God and they tremble. And I say today that at that point, the demons have got us beat by a long country mile because at least they have the knowledge to tremble in the presence of God because there are many today who do not tremble, do not fear God and give, them, give themselves to him. Like many of the professing Christians of today, Judah and Israel, they wanted the benefit of God's blessing. Many people today want the benefit of God's blessing. They will desire the benefit. Well, if I come to church, I've had people, when I was out working a lot, I had people that would come to me and uh, they found out I was a pastor and they would slip me a 20 in my hand and say, here, put that in the offering for me on Sunday and maybe God will bless me this week. Or preacher, would you say a prayer for me? Folks, I'll pray for you and I will gladly pray for you. But there's no reason why you shouldn't be praying and honoring and worshiping and lifting up the name of Almighty God in your own lives. That ought to be something that's happening. We all ought to have a true, honest, deep down in our heart relationship with Almighty God. We ought to desire to have God's presence in our lives, to walk with Him day by day. We ought to desire to know when we step outside the boundaries. We spoke last week about little children stepping across the boundary. You know, you tell them don't do something. And what do they do? They stick their foot out there and they go across the boundary. We ought to want to know when I've stepped outside the boundary by God's Word and by the prompting of the Holy Spirit, the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God upon our lives. And not to live in anything other than the, having Him as true Lordship. I was doing some reading this week pertaining to this and some other things. And as I was reading or maybe listening to another sermon or something along that line, I don't remember exactly where it was, but as I was reading, someone was talking about the fact that, you know, sometimes we'll say, well, I received Jesus at this age in my life, but then several years later, he became Lord of my life. Folks, we don't get him one way or the other. We get both all at once. If we claim him as Savior, we must claim him as the Lord of our lives, giving him complete ownership of our lives, complete rulership over our lives, because he has come to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Sometimes we come in and we have the idea that God, that, that God owes us something, that he must accept our feeble attempts to please him while heart commitment does not exist in our lives. And folks, you'll not find that in the Word of God. There were those attempts. 
There were those efforts by people along throughout time. We've always done it as part of our sinful nature that we feel like, well, you know, God owes us something. He must accept me just the way that I am. No, he tells us how he'll accept us. He'll accept us in humility. He'll accept us when we come to him with purity of heart. And when we call upon him and when we say, Lord, you come in and you control my life. And folks, it didn't just happen in the Old Testament. If you go all the way over to the book of Revelation, in chapters 2 and 3 in the book of Revelation, the letters to the churches, you'll find that God pointed out that Christ in his revelation to John and told him to write these things, send these letters out. And he corrected those churches. He said, these are the areas that you're lacking. So many times I think we develop a kind of a high horse attitude about our lives. Well, God will accept me the way that I am. He told those churches that some changes had better happen or their names will be removed from the book of life. God does not have to tolerate our sin. God does not have to tolerate our lives anything less than allowing him to be the Lord over our lives. They showed half-hearted obedience to God. And God said that is not acceptable. And folks, it was no different in Isaiah's day. It's no different today. They went through the motions and they had no sincerity of heart. I want us to go back this morning to the book of Isaiah as we think about. So go with me if you would be turning to Isaiah chapter 1 if you have your Bibles this morning. <clears throat> in Isaiah chapter 1, we're going to find a very clear, very concise, and very graphic outline of God's displeasure upon Judah and Israel during their time because of their sin. Now, as we are going to be reading this in just a few moments, I would remind you of the passage in Isaiah, the verse in Isaiah, or excuse me, in Malachi, that says, I am the Lord and I change not. God does not change. If God was graphic and pointed and clear about what sin was in Isaiah's time, God is still just as clear, just as pointed, and just as graphic about what sin is in our lives today. So as we read this passage, please pay very close attention to what God has to say. And let God speak into your lives this morning. Isaiah chapter 1 beginning in verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah... And Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know my people do not consider. Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed up or bound up or sued with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. So the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard, as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Unless the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? 
says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we come to you this morning, we come with grateful hearts that you are Almighty God. You are our creator. And not only are you the creator of all of the universes that we could imagine, but you are also the sustainer. You are the sustainer of our lives physically through your provision and your creation. But for those who know you as their Savior and Lord today, you become the sustainer of our lives spiritually because we have no ability of our own. Lord, we come today to celebrate a very serious ordinance that you have given us. The communion of the saints. Where we are reminded very vividly of the sacrifice that was given on our behalf. The broken bread, the broken body, the shed blood upon the cross. The atonement for our sin, for the sin that could be reconciled to you in no other way. So we come today, Lord, and first and foremost, we ask you to search our hearts, O Lord. Know our thoughts, try us, and see if there be any wicked way in us. And I pray today, dear God, that we would be led in the way everlasting. As we come to you this morning, Lord, we ask that you would touch our lives. And Lord, as Isaiah prophesied, and through him you exposed the sin of the nation, the sin of those who are going through the religious motions, that today, Lord, that we're not here to go through religious motions, that we're not here out of a sense of obligation. Or responsibility but we are here today because we desire you to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in our lives I pray dear God that we will wholly give ourselves to you as a congregation of people to your work to your sacrifice to be cleansed by you to be washed and made new by you that you might use us, that we might carry the good news, the gospel message of Jesus Christ into a lost and dying world, that we would carry it verbally, sharing the good news of Jesus, that we would carry it by the way that we live our lives, by the nearness, uh, the presence, 
of the Holy Spirit upon our lives that even, Lord, as we pass by people, they would know and understand that there's something different about our lives. But I pray today, dear God, that we would not be found only going through just a religiosity today, just a religious formality today as Judah had been doing. And you showed very clearly and graphically how unhappy you were with that. But Lord, that we come today and we pour ourselves out entirely before you. So would you speak to our hearts today, dear God? Would you move our lives today, dear God, if there's anything, any little bit of sin that is left in our lives that we have not confessed before you, today would be the day that we would give that to you, Lord. That as we come in just a little while to remember the great price that was paid for our sins, Lord, that we would come prepared and cleansed by you. And Lord, that as we receive the communion this morning, that we would be deeply reminded in our minds and in our hearts of your great love. And Lord, remember that you've been here once and that you are coming again and that that return could come at any moment. And Lord, why? What sin would we allow to stand in our lives in disobedience and rebellion to you? So Lord, would you touch us today, each and every one, and guide our lives. Compel us and strengthen us, dear Lord, to present ourselves to you for your glory and for your honor. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 1, Isaiah presents a vision. He shares a vision during the time that he was the prophet of the Lord, sharing in this prophetic ministry. Folks, this was not a vision that he had because he had eaten something spicy the night before. This wasn't just an odd dream that he had, but this was a dream. This was a vision given to him by God. It was a picture, if you will, of God's displeasure with his people. A people that he, in verse 2, likened, or excuse me, in verse 3, or uh, in, in, uh, in verse 2, he likened them to children that he has raised and he has nurtured. God's address to Judah in, in verse 2 is clear, and it is expressed as if it was given to the whole of creation. He cried out and he said, O heavens, give ear, O earth, hear. For God has spoken. Let me ask you a question this morning. When you think about the Lord has spoken, what does that say to you? What does that mean to you? What weight do you put on the Word of God for our lives? If you go back to Moses' time when Moses was going in Sinai, Mount Sinai and back, the people cried out and said, we want you to speak to us. We don't want God to speak to us because if God speaks to us, we might die. They took it seriously. But I want you to know today that we need to have God speaking to us. We need to hear from God. We need the Holy Spirit's guidance, and we need to put great weight. This document, this Bible that I hold in my hand, this library of 66 books written over a period of thousands, uh, a couple of thousand years by various authors ought to carry weight in our lives. It ought to be the most important thing that we can read. It ought to be the most important guidance for our lives. It ought to be the best roadmap that we can buy and that we can have. So when God speaks, the next question that comes in the question of what weight do we put on the Word of God, when God speaks as, as it is here, the next question is, comes then is how do I respond to Him? What is your response as God speaks? When you open the Scripture and you read that Israel, that Judah had gotten to this point, they were carrying out religious activities in accordance with the Word of God. But there was no heart depth to what they were doing. How does that speak to you? 
And how do we respond to God? Is it a response of obedience and respect or one of carelessness and defiance of God's holiness? You know, there's a lot of people out there that are very careless and defiant to the word of God. And they even profess to be Christians today. God spoke to Judah as a father speaks to a child, reminding them of past care and blessings upon them. But he was also clear in expressing to them disappointment in their rebellion. God's conviction on our lives is clear expression of disagreement with our sin. When you hear a word from the Lord, when you wake up some morning and you just have that heaviness in your heart and you know that there's something in my life today that's not right with God, that is God speaking his disagreement with the way that we're living our lives into our lives and God is trying through that to draw us back into that right relationship where we can seek forgiveness and we can yield to him. In verse 3, God uses an example of simple beast of burden. Simple-minded animals of the, of the barnyard of that day, you might say the oxen and the donkeys. He said the oxen is committed to the master and the donkey knows his way back to the crib. It's a simple process. He, they know where their supply comes from. They know who the master is. But in contrast, Israel had turned from God as their master and provider and they had turned to their disobedience in God. I want you to know today that a person who has no care for their soul is the most difficult to reach for Christ. Here in verse 3 he said, my people do not consider. There's no thought process. There's no care about sin. They're not considering the aspect of the life. If you witness to someone and they get angry at you, you have elicited a response. God is stirring something in their life. If you witness to someone and they're ignorant and they've never heard before and they've got to go and contemplate, chances are they'll be back to ask more questions. But when you share the gospel with someone who just simply does not care, they will continue to go on not caring. And I want to tell you that is a dangerous, dangerous place to be because God said they do not consider. In verse 4, sin had grown rampant and was universal amongst the nation. God says, alas, sinful nation, a people who are laden, burdened down, weighted with iniquity. I want to ask you a question. What just cause or pleasure in verse 5, he asked the question, why would you be stricken again? What just cause, what pleasure, what value is so great in our sin against Almighty God that is worth sinning against him and losing our soul for eternity? Is it worth it? Can you put a price on the rejection of God, on rebellion against God, and say that this is greater the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. But is it so great that we would give up our souls for it? Why would we continue in rebellion against a father that loves us so much? Remember the first week? Why we tolerate sin? Pharaoh was willing to spend one more night with the frogs. Entreat God tomorrow. So many times we put it off till tomorrow, till tomorrow. What about today? What about our response to God today? There came a time there was no putting off Jesus going to the cross. The day came. And when the day came, they crucified our Christ, the Son of God. Why? For the purpose of our atonement, for our reconciliation back into that right relationship with a God that loves us that much. Do you know today how much God truly loves you? In verse 6, he said, from the sole of the foot even to the head, there's no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they've not been closed or bound up or sued with ointment. Do y'all know that there's a difference between what the way we see ourselves and the way God sees us? And again, I refer back to that Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the letters to the churches. See, they thought they were doing pretty good. They they were proud of themselves. Well, look how good I am. When we get that attitude, we're oftentimes going to overlook yet that remnant of sin in our lives. 
And just as we spoke about a week or so ago, that sin is like the leavening in a lump, a little bit leaveneth the whole lump. Sin will come in. If we've broken one of God's commandments, we've broken them all. So do we remain in that or do we give ourselves over to God? Verses 7 and 8, neighboring countries had come in and were invading and leaving them desolate and defenseless. Sin robs us of all that is good and lasting in our lives. Have you ever seen people that get out into various types of sin? One of the things that happens is sin isolates. You say, oh, but they carry out sin in a lot of public places around a lot of people. Yeah, but they'll always tell you that they feel alone. Sin will single us out. Sin will isolate us. We'll feel like no one cares. And that's why it is so important in the Word of God that the Lord said for us to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. And what is second and likened to that is the great commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves. Folks, when you come in to God's presence and when you come into the presence of God's people, when we come together as the family of God, we don't come in to carry out a, a, a mindless religious performance, but we come to be in fellowship with one another, to love one another, to encourage one another, to be lifted up in the Word of God, so that when we leave, we know that we know that we're not alone because we have God on our side and because we have one another. We become a family of believers, a family that joins together in our walk with the Lord. In verses 9 through 11, he refers them and calls them uh, very similar to Sodom and Gomorrah. But if you'll remember, Abraham called out to the Lord and he got all the way down to 10. If there's 10 righteous, would you spare? There wasn't 10 righteous because sin was so rampant. But here God declared that there was a remnant. Folks, I want us to know today to lift up your heads, stand proudly, because we today have the opportunity to be the remnant of God's people for this nation. When we go out, we've been out over the last couple of weeks, we've been out sharing the message of Jesus Christ throughout our community. We've got one more event coming up this coming week uh, that, that's kind of been in a line of things that we've had going on. It's been kind of busy, that's okay. I'd rather be busy for God than I would to be busy in the world's foolishness. But when we go out into this community and we share Jesus Christ, we are showing them that there is a remnant of people left who love Almighty God. When Elijah got, went and sat down under the juniper tree and Elijah called out, Lord, just take my life. I'm the only one left and nobody else cares. There's a price on my head. God said, oh, hang on, Elijah. I've still got a lot more people over here. They're hid out and they've never bowed a knee to Baal. It's okay. You're not the only one. Folks, I want you to know today we're not the only ones. We don't have to go the way of the rest of the world. We don't have to be led off into the sin that they're going into because it just looks like, well, we're, we're just down to the end. But today we stand to be the remnant. Along with all the other committed Christians around the world, we stand to be the remnant. There are nations that the church is being highly persecuted in. And you'll see and hear about those people who are the remnant. And I for one want to say today I'm thankful that we're not having to be persecuted the way that they are. But I'm thankful to hear and I'm encouraged to hear the testimonies. That's why testimony services are so important. That's why our praise unto God for what God has done in our life. I've heard people just stand and say, I'm just thankful God loves me. But that in itself is a testimony. Because if God loves you as an individual, that means God knows you as an individual. And God cares about you as an individual. And God has a plan for you as an individual in his kingdom. In these verses, God showed displeasure and meaningless sacrifice that did not come from a repentant, changed heart. David spoke about this when in his famous psalm, Psalm 51, his prayer of repentance back to God because of his sin with Bathsheba. And in, I don't have it on the screen this morning, but in Psalm 51, verses 16 to 17, David wrote, For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. 
The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. When we come today to share in the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus, what is it that the Lord wants? He wants our heart to be broken toward him, to be humbled before him, to come and to remember what he's done on our behalf that we could not do on our law, in, in our own. Verses 12 through 15, he challenges and he says, don't bring these things, don't celebrate these things. He wasn't trying to change the Mosaic law. He wasn't about changing those things, the times and types of sacrifice. But he said there needed to be a need. There's no need for them to offer empty sacrifices without life change. You'll read here, if you read in the King James this morning, he said, I'm full. You know that feeling whenever you've eaten and you've eaten and you've eaten until you've just gotten full and you just can't put one more thing in your mouth? God said, I'm full. You ever told your children, I've had it up to here? Or your spouse maybe? Or somebody else, you know? I've had it up to here with that. That's how God felt about this meaningless sacrifice that was coming. But then God says in verses 16 and 17, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. God is here demanding an obedience from a changed heart. True repentance turns us 180 degrees from our sin. But those things that we put away, we put away one thing, but we put on something else. We put away sin. We put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. To live in his discipline and his changed life. And folks, when that happens, our relationship with him should be easily seen by those or by the way that we interact with one another. When we turn away from sin and turn to God, no other options exist. He said, cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. And then when he gets to verse 18, he says, come now and let us reason together. Now that's not an open dialogue situation. When God says, come now, let us reason together, we're about to hear a declaration. See, a lot of the times we think we ought to have just an open dialogue with God. Well, God, I don't know if I necessarily agree with this part of your word or that part of your word. Remember what he ended verse 20 with when he said, the Lord has spoken. I don't know about y'all, but did anybody else's parents look down upon you talking back when you were a child? Did anybody else, you know, when, when dad spoke or when mom spoke, that's it? That's the way it is? That end of discussion? That's what God's saying here. This is, not a, uh, this is not a dialogue. This is a declaration here. God will pardon. Look at... Uh, uh, Verse 18, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, you shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He will pardon if repentance and turning to him becomes the response of the people. Our sin has brought enmity between us and God that can only be reconciled through Jesus Christ. It's the only way. And I want you to think about something this morning. Did you realize that we are sinners on a double front? We're sinners on a double front. Twofold sinners we are. We are born into a sinful nature by virtue of Adam's sin. That's where the beginning, that's where the root of it is. There's a root of sin in our lives even as we're born. Take two toddlers, set them in a room and put one toy between them and what happens? The fight's on. Who had to teach them to do that? Did anybody teach them to be stingy? Did anybody teach them to say, that's mine? And to scratch and claw and pinch and bite and all the things that they do in order to get their way? No, that's that root of sin. But then as we live our lives, the scripture also says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How many of you know that every one of us here 
have committed multiple sins, multiple rebellions against God in our lives. So we have a responsibility here. This is not just a, a thought out there somewhere, but this applies to us. We are sinners by the disobedient deeds of our lives. And so when we come to the Lord, we come and we pour all that out before him. In verses 19 and 20, he said there's a blessing or a curse. And you'll find God dealing with those blessings or curses throughout his word. The blessing is when we obey. When we give ourselves, he said, if you'll come in repentance, your sins can be washed away. And Isaiah goes on and, and in many instances shares with us the coming Messiah, the one who will be the sacrifice for our sins, the one that we come to celebrate today. But he also said that there's going to be a curse involved for those who reject. The rejection by Pharaoh meant one more night with the frogs in that one instance that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. But folks, our rejection of God today may mean that you spend eternity in hell. He said, death will come. In this instance, he used the description of the sword, but he said, death will come. And again, <clears throat> the Lord has spoken. What's the weight of the word of God today in your life? If this is where God found Judah in their sin, what shape does God find our nation in today? But more specifically, what shape does God find our lives in today? And you may say, preacher, why are you preaching all these things? I've been a Christian for a lot of years. When's the last time that you've confessed before the Lord? When's the last time that you really took seriously? Because I want you to know, when Paul, when we read in a little while, we're probably not going to read the entirety of it this morning, but when we get ready to partake of communion in a little bit, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul said that this is to be taken very seriously. There's a way that you go about this. God intended for those sacrifices that Judah was making to be taken seriously. Today, we ought to take seriously the opportunity that we have to be able to come into God's house, to hear God's word, to sing God's praises. We ought to take seriously the fact that you don't have to come to me and confess anything to me. You don't have to come to me and ask me to pray for you, although I will and although I do, but you have a direct line. When Christ died on the cross, the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. If it was, if it was torn in two from the bottom up, it would have meant that man may have had something to do with it. But it started at the top, and God tore that open. It's because it's something that we couldn't do, and we all received the opportunity for an open line into heaven. To be able to speak to God, to be able to rejoice, to be able to worship Almighty God in our hearts. Christ died that we might have full pardon from our sins. Do our lives reflect that sacrifice? Do we live to honor the broken body and shed blood of Jesus? When we come momentarily to receive communion, are we doing it in honor? And does our lives represent the honor that should be presented today? As we live our lives, are we more concerned about what people around us see and know about us than what a holy God sees inside of us? You can fool me. I'm easily fooled. Judah thought they could fool God. But God said, when I look at you, I see a body that is filled with sores. Your sin causes you to look like a big infected sore. And yes, that's graphic. It is. But that's what God said. Because God sees us as we are on the inside. In verses 19 and 20, God gave Judah a chance, a choice, to repent and turn or to ignore God by continuing in sin and paying the price for it. What choice will you make today? As our musicians come, before we get into our communion service this morning, the scripture says that we are to take this very seriously. 
that we are to take this honorably before God in preparation of our hearts. So today, as we prepare, the very first thing that we want to do is give you an opportunity. Whether you pray at your seat or whether you come and kneel before Almighty God at one of these altars, that you give yourself, give God the opportunity to touch your life. Is God speaking to you today? Are you presenting yourself today cleansed before the Lord through the work of Jesus Christ, through the shed blood, the broken body of Christ today? Surrender yourself to the Lord today in its entirety. Maybe you gave yourself to Jesus and you wanted him to be your Savior a long time ago, but you've been holding off on making him the Lord of your life. Well, it's time today that those two things come together and they meet. So as we stand this morning, our altars are open and we invite you to come. We invite you to come and humble yourself. The Bible tells us to prepare ourselves. Use this time to prepare yourself for our communion service. Would you please stand? And our altars are open as we have this song of time and time of, of just a response to the Lord.